Justin Foscue is a big leaguer. On today's show, we're talking about what he brings to the Rangers, how often he's going to play, and how the Rangers will deal with Josh Young's injury. All that and more on this episode of Locked On Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers, your daily Texas Rangers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked on to the World Series champion Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan covering this team for 11 seasons, including all six as the founder and host of this podcast. Thank y'all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers. Hit subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform and on YouTube, where the best way you can help grow the show is to comment nearly any single thing below. Now, the big news out of Rangers land yesterday is that first round pick Justin Foscue is officially, officially a big leaguer. Not quite as officially enough of getting his first big league at bat, his first big league game, his first big league hit or home run, but he is on the big league roster and that counts for something. Congratulations to former first round pick Justin Foscue, the Rangers 2020 first round pick. Now the Rangers already have their first round and second round picks from the 2020 draft in the big leagues. I think at least four out of five of those picks will be big leaguers for probably an extended period of time. And two of them are no longer in the Rangers system because they were traded for Jordan Montgomery, who helped the Rangers win a World Series. So that draft class is looking pretty darn good at this point. But Justin Foscu, who is he? Well, he's a first first baseman slash third baseman now, originally drafted as a second baseman out of Mississippi State in the first round. A very head-scratching pick at the time. Felt like a very safe pick in that draft, a very signable pick, and really confused me at the time. I thought, okay, this guy's for sure going to be a big leaguer, but at what position? And, and is he going to hit enough for him to make it to the big leagues and be an impact big leaguer? I think the answer is going to be yes, eventually. Whether it's with the Rangers or whether it's with someone else, congratulations to Justin Foscue for making the big leagues at all. He is a bat-first guy who played primarily second base, but he is not going to be playing probably any second base at the big level. He was he was fine there defensively at second base. <clears throat> Seems passable at first base, even though he's learning that very, very quickly. Did spend a little bit of time in left field, but the thing that's going to keep him in the big leagues is, well, it's going to be his bat for sure. Actually, I misspoke. I thought he spent some time in left field. That has not been the case. Thought they might try him out there, but that has not happened in his professional career. Has played 35 games last season at third base, 70 games at second base, 9 games at first base last year, 12 games at third in 2022. And before that, he hadn't played much first base really at all. Three games in his freshman year at Mississippi State. Um, and other than that, he also caught one game his freshman year at Mississippi State. Real real all over the di- diamond kind of guy. Um, but good on him for making the big leagues. And, and as for how often he's going to play, well, I've already seen the lineup for this Wednesday game. And uh, he is not in it because <laughs> there is a right-handed starting pitcher on the mound. And there will be... I think all three starting pitchers this weekend against Houston will be right-handers because Framber Valdez threw on Tuesday. So I don't think the Rangers are going to see him at all. And uh, at this point, it seems like it's going to be a platoon between Foscue and Jared Walsh at first base, righty versus lefty starter. Maybe he'll get a pinch hit appearance if there is a lefty thrown in there to to pitch against Jared Walsh. Um, But it's, it's hard to see him getting a whole lot of playing time early. As for why the Rangers did this move specifically, I, I would like to see him get his first big league plate appearance, his big first big league hit in this stint up at the big leagues, because I feel like as soon as as soon as soon Nathaniel Lowe comes back, it, it's going to be right back down for Justin Foscue, which is a shame, but it, it's kind of what I think is, is probably going to happen. Unless the Rangers just want to cut bait with Jared Walsh, I don't think they'll keep two guys or three first basemen basically on the roster even while while Josh Young is is on the injured list I just don't think that's going to be how it goes down as for why I don't think he plays third base well I think there's there's three reasons for that 
Number one, Zeke Duran is really good. I know he had some struggles there at third base defensively last year, but he is still a very good defensive third baseman. His versatility is what makes him the best of the three guys who could spend some time at third base that are on the roster right now between Zeke Duran, Josh Smith, and Justin Foscue. Offensively, I think Ezekiel Duran is, is by far the best option there. Defensively, I think the best option there is Josh Smith. And, well, defensively at third base, Justin Foscue is, well, he's a pretty good hitter. <laughs> he's a guy who has really, really quality at bats. He has got some power that he is very, very streaky with that power. When he goes on a hot streak with those home runs, I mean, buddy, look out. That guy could absolutely mash. But the thing that doesn't change about Justin Foskey, the thing I liked most about his season last year where he spent the full year in Round Rock is that he walked significantly more than he struck out. Not just by a little bit, by a lot. 85 walks to 70 strikeouts for him. He also stole 14 bags. Granted, he only was successful two-thirds of the time in his attempts. But still, I liked him being aggressive. He had never had more than three stolen bases at any level in his minor league career. So good on him for being a little bit more aggressive on the base pass. 18 home runs for him last year. Four triples, 31 doubles. The guy's going to get a lot of doubles. That is something you will see a lot with Justin Foscue. And as for his defense, well, he can hit. He might be acceptable at third base for a little bit might be and a little bit but he is here for his bat no doubt about it there was some question about whether he might squeeze out white langford for the rangers starting dh but white langford was just was just too darn good for that And, and this kid can really hit like don't get me wrong this kid can absolutely hit but the questions about his defense and the Rangers already having a primary DH who is Wyatt Langford, who is is doing some pretty incredible things. Um, it, it makes it really hard to find a spot for him. It, it's why basically every offseason I've been including him in you know hypothetical trade packages because I, I think he is a big leaguer. I think he can definitely hit big league pitching at a competent level, and he can provide very, very quality at bats, which is something that this Rangers lineup really prides itself on. It's what makes this lineup so deadly. It's what made them so darn good in the postseason is that they're not going to throw away at bats. They have a very smart approach. They have a very good game plan pretty much every time out there. It doesn't always work. Can't always execute it. But this Rangers lineup is has got to be one of the most annoying, frustrating, and maddening to face as a starting pitcher because these guys know what they're doing. They know what they're about. They... They know how to work counts and, and foul off pitches and have prolonged at-bats and see a lot of pitches for not just themselves, but for the guy behind them. And they know they're not going to try and do too much. None of these guys in this lineup, even Corey Seager, are going to try and play hero ball. If you're going to try and walk them, if you're not going to give them anything to hit, they're going to walk and take their walk and, and trust the next guy up will do the exact same thing. If He will take advantage when there is a pitch to hit. Or if he doesn't, then the guy behind him will do that. And if he doesn't, then the guy behind him will do that. Or somebody will at some point. Because this offense has been so darn good. And even in a loss last night, they still had the game-tying run at the plate. Just a few feet away from a game-tying home run in Leo Tavares in the top of the ninth inning. Rangers did claw across another run in that 5-2 to loss that was very atypical. We'll talk more about that later. But as for what the Rangers are going to do with Josh Young, he had surgery on that broken wrist. He is going to miss six weeks, which I think is about as close to the best case scenario as we could hope. What I was thinking was multiple months minimum, maybe three months, because those broken wrists, they can really, really take a long time to heal. But Thankfully, the Rangers got as good a news as they can. Six weeks on the recovery time, which would put Josh Young back sometime in May. I believe it would be May 14th if we are going on the dot. The Tuesday, May 14th, in a series against the Guardians. And that's good news for the Rangers. It's still really rough for Josh Young, who was having an incredible season. An incredible season so far. I know it was four games, but... The guy looked absolutely unstoppable at the plate defensively. We all know how darn good he is. Um, and you can see my my co-host, if, if you're watching on YouTube in the corner, getting a little angsty, uh, my dog, Lily, because she sees somebody walking outside. Um, but Josh Young, 
It's not get is going to be angsty for the next six weeks of going through rehab when he just got back from that injury. I don't think this is going to break him mentally. I don't think this is going to wear on him too much. He's obviously really dejected, but it, it's on his teammates to pick him up and you know get him going, get him motivated to help him out and say, "Hey, this is just this is a bad break, but you know what? You're going to shake it off and you're going to come back, and we're going to be just we're going to be you know fine enough without you. We're going to want you back, but hey." This lineup is definitely deep enough to survive. Coming up, we're to talk about why Josh Smith and Ezekiel Duran are both so incredibly important to the Rangers right now. And we get an update on Max Scherzer and when we can expect him back. Right after this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Spring training is over and baseball season is officially underway. Don't miss your chance to add your favorite players from the diamond in your Prize Picks entries. Whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, first inning runs, take your pick of more or less and add them to your prize picks entry today. Prize picks is the best way to get in on the action on sports and in more than 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. Testing your skills on prize picks this baseball season is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $100 with just a few taps. Price Picks is really simple to play. You can make your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. Price Picks also offers weekly promotions and special offers for the biggest moments in sports. Download the app today and use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, download that app today and create use, use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Price Picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Shout out to the Everyday Rangers making Lockdown Raiders your first listen every single day. On tomorrow, we'll be back and talking about this final game of the series in Tampa. How Nate Eovaldi look if the Rangers are able to win their first road series and continue that road magic from the 2023 World Series run. Now, the Rangers have some exceptional bench bats that are no longer about to be bench bats in Josh Smith and Ezekiel Duran. There are a lot of hypothetical trades about the Rangers maybe making a trade for some big starting pitcher and maybe including either Josh Smith or Zeke Duran because both those guys, I think they're capable of being first division everyday starters. Zeke Duran a little bit more so. I think he's more on the borderline all-star candidate case. But I think if Josh Smith, there's plenty of teams where Josh Smith is better than the starting shortstop on that team. I think there's several teams that are... Not competitive teams, but teams where I think that he could be a much better player. I mean, look at Detroit and Javi Baez. No, no offense to Javi Baez. A little offense to Javi Baez. But I think Josh Smith is a very, very important player. And <clears throat> at the start of the season, full strength, Josh Smith is the Rangers' basically second choice backup shortstop slash third baseman slash second baseman. Josh Smith, that guy who puts together quality at-bats, plays really good defense, is left-handed, has a little bit more thump than I think people are expecting. And that's your second backup, not your primary backup in Zeke Duran, who's going to play a lot this year, who was already going to play a lot this year, just to give Corey Seager some more time off his feet. He is DHing, Corey Seager is, that is, DHing in this final game of the series. And we're getting to see Josh Smith and Zeke Duran both in the lineup at the same time, <clears throat> which I already thought we were going to see a little bit of early this season. Just I thought the Rangers might give, even had he not get gotten injured, I think the Rangers might have given Josh Young a, a day off maybe in this finale because he also came just came back from injury just like Corey Seager did. And, and Seager's a guy who he might play 100. I, I'm hoping for about 140 games this year of Seager. So that'd be about 20 games missed. Not because I think he's going to miss a lot of time, but especially 140 games maybe at, at shortstop. Because this is a guy you got to keep healthy. He is the best hitter in baseball. He is a shortstop. And to be able to be both of those things. Well, maybe maybe Mookie Betts is, is taking that role of best shortstop or best hitter in baseball because he is absolutely nuclear over there already on pace for like a 28 F war season. Um, but Corey Seager's pretty darn impressive as well. And you have got to get that guy some days off of his feet, especially if the Rangers are going to go on a prolonged postseason run, especially coming off of that prolonged postseason run and that sports hernia surgery that he had like two months ago. It was really not that long ago that Corey Seager just had surgery. The fact that he's able to make the Rangers opening day lineup and, and be in there most days, that is a good sign for the Rangers, but also a sign that you, know, you need to be extra cautious. 
And I think Zeke Duran, when fully healthy, as the Rangers, you know, backup primary infielder, I think he's the best best bench bat in the league, best bench player overall value in the league. A guy who's not an everyday starter. The guy was a borderline All Star last year. Like he just was that good last year, and having that value to come in and step in and replace your literal All Star third baseman who is going to be on the shelf for six weeks, which is an absolute bummer. That's the kind of thing that keeps these teams who, you know, just come off of a repeat. It, it's the kind of thing that can prevent a World Series hangover because injuries happen, especially when you're coming off of that deep of a run that we've, we've seen it happen already to position players that we didn't see knocked up that much last year. Nathaniel Lowe played, I believe, 161 games last year and hadn't really ever been hurt in his career. And he got hurt in spring training because playing baseball for seven months to post six months takes a toll on the body. Hopefully, Nathaniel Lowe is going to be back next week sometime, hoping we can see a little bit more of him, add some more pop to this lineup, but just a good sign to have this kind of level of depth and, and to be able to call up Justin Foscue to, to maybe get some reps in there at first base or DH or, or what have you. Um, I'm hoping that we actually get to see him in a game before Nathaniel Lowe comes back and the Rangers probably send him down. But even if you don't, having Zeke Durant and Josh Smith is such an important part of this team and such an important part of why the Rangers were able to win 90 games last year, despite missing around 40 games from Corey Seager. But speaking of injured players, injured all-stars, I should say, Max Scherzer threw a 55-pitch bullpen on Monday. It was his third bullpen session since returning to the mound sometime last week. He is expected to return sometime around May 20th to 25th which is a little bit earlier than if he went on the 60-day IL. This is why the Rangers didn't put him on the 60-day IL. If he was on that IL, he wouldn't have been able to return until May 28th. But at this point, it's going to be somewhere around May 20th to 25th. We're not entirely sure. So you're going to get Josh Young back hopefully around May 14th. That's the series against the Guardians. And then somewhere between May 20th and 25th, for the return of Max Scherzer. That will be hugely helpful because that week is a six-game road trip to Philadelphia and then to Minnesota. Those are going to be some tough games against some playoff teams from last year that are probably going to be playoff teams again this year. <clears throat> the Rangers can use all the help they can get in the rotation. We'll see when we end up getting Michael Lorenzen back in this rotation. I imagine it'll be sometime in this 17-game and 17-day stretch, but Getting that good news about Max Scherzer, it, it kind of confuses me that, you know, it's tw May 20th to 25th, so that would be, if it if it is, does end up being May 25th, that's a Saturday against the Twins, and he would have been eligible to come off the 60-day IL May 28th against the Diamondbacks, that's two games difference. So I think I'm leaning more towards the May 20th return because getting another week another start of Max Scherzer. I think that's more what the Rangers are hoping for and expecting. <clears throat> we'll see how much he does in terms of rehab starts. I'd imagine he'll have at least one or two because he's still building up like it's his spring training. He said he's feeling good. The arm was always feeling good. It was just about you know other parts of his body you know, coming back and, and feeling fully healthy. And, and that's a that's a big thing for Max Scherzer. If Max Scherzer can be fully healthy, <clears throat> again, I talk about this a lot on the preseason preview that week of opening day that Max Scherzer is a big old X factor in this Rangers squad. We saw what he looked like when he was healthy with the Rangers last year. That's a really darn good pitcher. Might be the number one on the staff right now. Might be number two, depending on how Nate Eovaldi is looking on a given day. But that is a huge boost for the Rangers, hoping to get him back sooner as opposed to later. But again, until then, the Rangers are hoping to try and tread water in this April schedule with seven games in 10 days against the Astros then a road trip of 10 days, three of which in Houston, four, four in Detroit, which Detroit's a scrappy team this year with a lot of good pitching, and then ending that road trip with three games in Atlanta. And then you got three games against Seattle later this month. It is all about treading water, staying 500, staying in the hunt until those big guns come back one by one by one, having that depth to maintain whatever slings and arrows the Rangers face along the way while they're waiting for that depth to come back. Right now, the Rangers are, are sitting above 500. They can stay 500 
by the time that the Rangers get Josh Young and Max Scherzer back, they are in a very good spot to hopefully make a deep stretch run like we are hoping to see from this team. Coming up, we're talking about Andrew Heaney looking good, but the defense letting him down. And an Asian pitcher who might be the best that's come over in quite a while, and the Rangers being in on Roki Sasaki. Right after this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. Priority, which means last minute deals, you can save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. These flash deals save you even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats and get ahead of ahead of the game or event. Save even more when you choose the section and let game time choose the seats. Toggling the all-in pricing feature shows you the total up front with no surprise fees at checkout, which is the best part of the game time app in my opinion. So go take the guesswork out of buying tickets. For a limited time, all users can get $20 off any MLB purchase of $150 or more in game time app with code with code first pitch terms apply that's code f-i-r-s-t-p-i-t-c-h for twenty dollars off from march 25th to april 15th april 14th only download game time today the download the game time app today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed Shout out to the Everyday Rangers making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. On Friday's show, we'll be talking about the minor league season starting. I'll be at Frisco Rough Riders Media Day today, Wednesday. So I'll be talking about what to expect from the Rangers minor leagues this season on Friday. Now, reports came in that the Rangers are among the teams that are scouting Japanese right-handed pitcher Roki Sasaki. If you don't know about Roki Sasaki, why were you not watching the World Baseball Classic last year? This guy was absolutely sensational for the Samurai on Team Japan, the winning team of the World Baseball Classic. This is a young right-handed pitcher, 22 years old. He will turn 23 in November 3rd of this year. He's listed at 6'2", 187 pounds, and the guy has got probably the nastiest fastball in all of baseball around the world. Runs it up all the way to 102 with some disgusting movement got some good breaking stuff as well he is very very young he has asked for his team to post him after last season they denied that request but this year i feel like it's going to be time for the young japanese righty to be posted the rangers are among the team about six teams that are scouting him including the dodgers of course and an unnamed gm when talking about rookie sake said of course the dodgers are going to be the only ones to land him because why wouldn't they be? I mean, they've already got Yoshinobu Yamamoto. They have got Shohei Otani. Um, and, well, they've had a lot of success signing great pitchers out of Asia the last few years. And, well, uh, this is the next great pitcher coming out of Asia. A young guy. You don't normally see people hit free agency at this young an age. And the Rangers are desperately trying to get under the luxury tax this year to reset that tax threshold because there will be a lot of starting pitchers available on the market this offseason. And I expect the Rangers to be in play for at least one of them because Jacob deGrom is is hopefully going to be back and fully healthy. Nathan Eovaldi will have an option for next year. He will be another year older, but Max Scherzer will be a free agent. Andrew Heaney will be out the door. Um, I believe John Gray has one more season after this one. Um, but other than that, the Rangers will will need some help at the top end of their rotation. And while there will be a Corbin Burns on the market, there will be a Max Freed on the market. I think the guy who gets the most money on the market will be Yoshi, Roki Sasaki. Not Yamamoto. Roki Sasaki. And with Chris Young, the salesman, we saw him... If the Rangers are coming off a second World Series, that, that I think, might be what has to happen for the Rangers to land Roki Sasaki. That and Ray Davis to pony up and open the checkbook. Um, But if the Rangers come off two straight World Series, if the Rangers want to get Roki Sasaki, I can't imagine the salesman Chris Young, who was able to get Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager to both sign here, coming off a 100-loss season with 
what looked like very little hope from the outside. I am just drooling at the thought of adding a 23-year-old right-handed pitcher who can throw up to 102 miles an hour. Now, let's talk about a starting pitcher who did not does not throw 102 miles an hour. That is Andrew Keeney coming off of a great game against the Rays where the defense let him down. And part of the defense was his own defense. The All five runs were attributed, you could attribute them to defensive misplays. The first run came off of a deflected ball by Andrew Heaney to a ball that was going to be hit to Marcus Simeon. Would have been an easy out. Probably would have gotten out at the inning. Then all four runs were unearned runs in that fifth inning. He wasn't able to make it out of the inning because he got to two outs. And then Jared Walsh had a miscue, a ball that just dinked right off of his glove in the middle of no man's land between the first baseman, second baseman, and right fielder's territory. I think Adolis Garcia Sia maybe could have made a play on it, usually if the outfielder has a beat on it they'll make the call, but it kicked right off of Walsh's glove, and then the Rangers were not able to put those guys away. That was the end of the day after that for Andrew Heaney. Yerry Rodriguez came in, gave up a three-run bomb. So three unearned, four unearned runs for the Rangers in that one, and that, those are the only runs that scored for Tampa Bay. Those four unearned runs that came off of defensive miscues and five runs, one one was earned off of a defensive miscue, and then four unearned runs off a of defensive miscue. That is not typical of this Rangers team that has been so good defensively. They even had a really great play from Leoti defensively, an outfield assist, which again shows you why Leoti Tavares is the Rangers center fielder. Getting Randy Rosarena out on an attempted sack fly at home plate, it had him gunned down pretty easily. Wasn't super deep in center field, and I was kind of surprised that that the Rays ended up sending Randy Rosarena, but Leo Tavares said, okay, you're challenging my arm in center field. Please keep doing that. Please keep challenging the Rangers' arms in center field and right field, specifically when it's Leo Tavares and Adoles Garcia out there in the outfield. But other than that, it was a really good day for Andrew Heaney. Four hits, no walks for him. That's huge. And seven strikeouts. The guy had his swing and miss fastball going for sure. 12 swings and misses on that fastball. Six swings and misses on the slider. Was able to throw the curveball through it seven times, which he is now actually throwing that curveball again. He shelved it with the Dodgers, and he didn't use it last year with the Rangers because it was getting absolutely mashed when he was with the Angels. But throwing it in the right spots, in the right counts, early in counts to get those called strikes, not trying to make it a swing and miss, put out pitch. Uh, that is his slider and his fastball. That's that's what those are. Also surprised with a lineup comprised entirely of right-handers, well, righties and switch hitters, that he only used two change-ups. That was a little surprising to me. But, hey, it worked out mostly pretty well, and had it not been for a defensive error, going five innings, seven strikeouts, one run. That's a good Heaney performance, but Yuri Rodriguez came in and his velocity was down. That fastball was averaging 96.1 miles an hour, whereas before on the year is averaging 97. So when he is, you know, 95 to 97, that's a little bit more hittable than when he is 97 to 99. The slider was still getting some good swings and misses. I mean, four swings and misses on seven swings total. That's solid, but one bad pitch that wasn't even that bad a pitch that got hammered, hammered for that three-run homer. That was really the difference in this game. But, hey, these games happen. Eventually, defense lets you down. Um, but still, the Rangers go, are, are 500 on the road right now. They can continue that, continue being 500 just in general for the first two months of the season while they're waiting for Max Scherzer and Josh Young to get back. Then that will be a big bonus for the Rangers. Now, officially, Baseball Savant finally has their numbers up. There's been enough games that they can have their leaderboards up for the season. Just some fun things looking at Wyatt Langford's Baseball Savant page and and seeing his sprint speed being in the top 3% of baseball, 29.4 feet per second, 97th percentile. That's insane. Also, his max exit velocity, the hardest he's hit a ball this year, 114, 111, excuse me, 0.4 miles an hour. That's in the top 7% of baseball. So in terms of his ability to absolutely hit the crap out of baseball, top 7%. Sprint speed, top 3% of baseball. That is a rarefied error. I did hear some questions about whether Leody Tavares or 
White Langford or Evan Carter were the fastest on this team? Well, we have empirical data. White Langford, 29.4 feet per second. So, 97th percentile. Right now, Evan Carter, 29.8 feet per, cent, per, feet per second. That's the 99th percentile. So Evan Carter's got a little bit of an edge there. But then you look at Leo Tavares. He hasn't sprinted enough this season to qualify for leaderboards this year. But last year, he was at 29.1 feet per second, 92nd percentile. So the top 8% of sprinters in baseball. So Wyatt Langford is faster than Leo Tavares. I knew that Wyatt Langford was fast, but this level of speed, and as we saw on Tuesday, Monday's game, this level of aggression on the base paths, that is an exciting thing to see from a prospect. Another thing that I noticed early on this season, I noticed it in spring training. I wasn't sure if it was going to carry over, but Marcus Simeon having an elite walk rate this year, a truly elite walk rate. 20.8% of his plate appearances have ended in a walk this year. That's the 97th percent of baseball. You might wonder who's tops in baseball. You probably shouldn't wonder. It's Evan Carter. 27% of his plate appearances this year have ended a walk. That's the tops in all of baseball. Evan Carter is also striking out less, 9% of the time. So that's nice. Still swinging and missing a little bit, but the chase rate is is up from last year. He's not going to maintain a 9% chase rate. That's unheard of. But seeing Marcus Simeon walk a little bit more early this year, he walked 9.6% of the time last year, which was above average and still a little bit more than he had walked in his career, a 9.1% walk rate for his career. If he can be an elite walk guy, adding in that power, that is the one part of his game that I thought could be a little bit better last year. And as a leadoff guy, if you've got an elite power, doesn't strike out a whole lot, gets on base and can be aggressive on the base paths with an elite walk rate, Marcus Simeon, who's coming off of a seven-war season, might be getting even freaking better. That's nuts. This lineup is nuts. And even coming off of a rough day and some rough injury news of Josh Young the last couple of days, this team is still in a great spot moving forward. That's going to do it for today's show. Thank you all so much for listening and subscribing. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy World Series champion Texas Rangers baseball.